All right, it says we are live here. Uh, water, drink water, everybody drink water. We don't need to talk about why we drink water so much or what it can do to you, but just drink your water. Make sure you're keeping up with that. It is the hot summer season and it is going to be a rough one as it always is. So just do me a favor, please keep up with it. Um, so we're talking about cooling towers. Last uh, training, so two weeks ago, uh, we we left off with kind of just real basic, just kind of rough draft of uh, some basic water conditions that we might deal with with a cooling tower. So I'm going to dive a little deeper into those. I want to talk more about the actual troubleshooting piece of it. Last time I got a bit hung up in the weeds on uh, like some of the startup stuff and commissioning and uh, approach values. I do want to just reiterate because uh, it is very critical to really understand and be able to process a, um, uh, a cooling tower troubleshoot is the approach value is, is critical. Um, it's most of the time with the tower though, we're dealing with some kind of either mechanical or electrical issue, but just for the sake of when you run into a system that is having a, um, uh, it's, it's having a actual control issue. It could be because of the approach value. So you need to monitor your wet bulb. Just rule of thumb. You, you're, you'll take your, uh, your wet bulb temp. I'm going to use Fahrenheit. So your wet bulb temp, and you'll subtract that, uh, or you'll, you'll subtract your wet bulb temp into your uh, leaving water from the tower itself, whether that's the tower basin on an open loop or whether that is the leaving pipe coming out of the bundle on a closed loop system. That gives you your tower approach. Okay. The rule of thumb is five degrees. There are some towers that are more efficient than that. They can get down to say three degrees. There are some towers, especially older ones, that may not even do five. Uh, you might not be able to get it past seven. So it does depend on your tower. Most tower literatures should tell you if you're able to actually find literature on it to begin with. So that can be its own challenge. I just I, This is a really easy thing to check. And if we're not careful, the reason I push this so much, if you're not careful when you first start to look at a tower issue, um, if you don't realize what your wet bulb is, you could end up spending an entire day going through all the mechanical, going through all the electrical, just racking the heck out of your brain, thinking you've got balancing issues, thinking you've got all this stuff, and you end up finding that ultimately there's not anything wrong with the tower. It's not dirty. It's not got a restriction in flow. Airflow is working fine. Everything's doing what it's supposed to do. And all it is, you've got a really humid environment that's forcing your wet bulb temperature really high. And the tower's just not capable of producing that cold of water with those conditions. Now, that also means that just you've got to figure out how to manage it from a building side at that point. Um, and that's not such an easy thing to, to address. So this is where we get into really talking about the building piece of um, troubleshooting a cooling tower. You're going to be dealing with a building troubleshoot majority of the time. And I, I talked about this last time a bit, but when you're dealing with a tower issue, uh, usually these towers are tied to an entire piping network that is running the, uh, the span of, well, all the buildings condenser water load. So we've got to be able to, whether it's water source heat pumps, self-contains, uh, or, or chillers of some kind, whether it be centrifugal or um, let's say a screw chiller, whatever your equipment is, it doesn't matter. That tower has to be able to keep up with it. That also means being able to run proper GPM through it and keep a proper temperature. Now we have the ability to, because in some cases, most compression equipment or positive displacement equipment is able to uh, support operation up till about, we start touching about 90 degrees of entering water into the equipment, which means you're leaving water coming out of the tower 
is about 90. Uh, that's when you're really going to start pushing the limits of your head pressure on most positive displacement systems. Now, a centrifugal is a different story, and we won't dive into that. That's a lot more complex of an answer. But ultimately, uh, there's some of the calls that can come in sometimes is, hey, we want to run our tower loop at 80 degrees, but uh, you're getting a peak load of a day and they can't keep the tower below, let's say, 83 or 85. Well, that could turn into a service call for you. That's where we have to start evaluating a little deeper. And we're looking at it from a building perspective. Okay, what's our split across the tower? So most towers should be fully capable of handling about a 10 degree split, just like we would have on anything else. So if we're putting in 90 degrees, we ought to be able to effectively spit back out about 80 degrees, given our approach value is, is somewhat reasonable. Uh, by the way, on the chat, I'm gonna do my best to keep up with it. I do not have uh, somebody here helping along, but uh, I'll do my best. So high temperatures. So what are some things that play into high temperature? A high temperature condition, meaning our leaving water is high, um, because that's part of the cascading effect. Uh, I'll dive into this real quick. If your leaving water starts to rise, then your entering water is going to rise with it. So when the tower, let's say you get to a building and the tower's been down. Let's say the cooling tower fan had tripped off. It wasn't moving air. For whatever reason, something had failed. Maybe it blew a belt. Maybe it had the belt sling off. You put a new belt on it, made sure everything was aligned and you're good to go. Well, now that tower has to pull that building back down. Most of the time, it's gonna be able to do that. Uh, it's gonna take some time though. And uh, that's if the equipment inside hasn't already completely tripped out. So, you get into kind of a complicated scenario there. So what I suggest to you is the first thing you got to do is let the tower catch up. Even though it may have some really hot water coming into it, maybe they're right in the edge. Maybe you got there just in time. Everything's getting hot, it's heating up, it's getting hotter. And you're trying to, uh, you're trying to keep the whole building from just crashing. Well, there's a couple options. If you have any spaces that are, <clears throat> that are not occupied, I would recommend go ahead and see if the customer can shut those spaces down. Let's get some load off of that condenser water loop and let that tower, uh, once it's got the airflow reestablished, let it try to pull that load back down some and then turn those units back on later. If the building has already started to trip out and you still have a hot loop, because uh, a lot of times that, that is something we see. Uh, the building goes down because of a tower issue. We get called out because equipment's going down. They don't know that the tower is the problem. You got called out there because they're tripping on the equipment. Maybe it's the top couple of floors, for example. Uh, maybe your top two floors are having head pressure issues because, because they're at the top of the loop. Uh, and let's say your tower is down on the ground. Because they're at the top of the loop, they're going to get the, uh, the least amount of GPM as a total uh, throughout the loop. So everything down below that floor has just enough GPM going through it to be able to maintain it on the razor's edge. But those top one or two floors just can't make it happen. So that's your call you've had come in is you've got units up there. So you're going to get there and you're going to see that those units are running uh, right on the edge of, of head pressure or they're tripped out on, on high pressure switch or limit, something of that nature. That's, that's going to be the basic condition. Uh, and it, you'll probably still, like it saves this uh, self-contained or SCUD system, uh, you will probably still have the flow switch closing. Uh, but the water temperature is getting so high mixed with the GPM values that that system just can't cool the condensers down enough. At that state, that right there tells you you've got a cooling tower issue. One, it's spread across the entire floor or most of the floor. Let's say it's got two wings and this particular wing, which is the furthest wing from the pumps, the furthest wing from the tower and the highest wing up. So it's the furthest possible away from a piping perspective and, and just in, 
or specifically from a piping perspective. It's the furthest away. Um, those are the ones tripping out. Well, if it's consistent like that, and it's all of your circuits, let's say you had four circuits and all four circuits can only run a couple of minutes before they trigger, you don't have a unit problem, or at least not right there. So you don't really, uh, you could check a strainer, you could check flow, there's things to verify. There's things to verify. But end of the day, you most likely have a cooling tower problem. And that's when you check your water temperatures. That should be the very first thing you check is you're seeing all those trips on the high head pressure. You're then going to turn around and what's my entering water? Most of those systems will have a readout that'll tell you that. Even if they don't, uh, go check the pipe temp itself coming into the unit. Even if you don't have a thermometer on the pipe, you can at minimum, uh, if all you have is a little thermometer or a K-type thermocouple, whatever it is, Put it to the pipe, tape it on there. I don't care what or how you go about it. Get some form of a pipe temperature. If you have the temperature gauges that are busted, let's say the, they have thermometers that are in some form of a, a dry well, but they don't work, take the gauge out and stick your temp probe into the well itself and just remove the gauge from the equation. You can still get an accurate reading uh, with your temp probe inside the well and just make sure that the tip of the probe is touching the housing inside of the well housing. So and by, by a well, uh, it's literally just, here's your pipe. Uh, you would have, say, a three quarter inch nipple sticking out or a tap. And then you're going to have this larger, um, uh, typically the brass section sticking out. And then you would have threaded into that, and it might even be larger than that, is gonna be the, the nut for your temp gauge. Uh, you get the idea. You got your little square gauge sticking up, right? So this part unthreads out of this well, and this would be one indicator that you have a well, so you can stick your temp, if you pull this gauge out, this well is sticking down into the water stream and you can put your temp probe in here and get a temperature right there on it instead of trying to go through the thick housing of the steel uh, of the steel pipe anyway if this it, water is elevated let's say it is anywhere close to or above 90 degrees um, You've, you got to figure out why your, your water is running high. So that's going to lead you to the cooling tower uh, or the pump. You know, you could have a pump issue. There's other things. This isn't a one size fit. My, my point is this is an indicator that you don't have to troubleshoot the unit you're looking at. That unit tripping on high head pressure is a symptom. Your problem is in the water. Now, work your way back through the pipe. Um, what I do in a situation like this, there's all kinds of things you can do. You could go through the strainer, make sure if it has strainers, are the strainers cleaned? You could go through the pumps, are all the pumps working? Are they clean? Yada, yada. What I actually do though, is I kind of skip a few steps and I'll just go to the tower. I may stop at the pumps just to see what the pumps are doing, but I just go to the tower and I see what's happening at the tower level. Is all are the fans running on the tower? Because if my water is this high, if I'm if I'm pushing that high, I should have all fans on. They ought to be maxed out, uh, whether they're on a variable speed drive or on a, a two speed uh, contactor setup, whatever the the conditions are. Uh, and then I um, uh, I should hear water. I should hear that whether if it's a closed loop, the spray pump ought to be running. If it's an open loop, I will be able to walk up and hear that water coming down over the tower. So there's just some immediate things that will key off. And you can hear, it takes practice, but you can tell the tone of the tower fan. You can tell the tone of the water. You can look at the water. What's my water level in the basin? There's just there's so many things that you can start immediately analyzing that's gonna help you determine if there's something obvious with the tower. A lot of the time, our tower issues are fairly obvious. Now, they may require a little bit of visual investigation, 
but the typically obvious end of the day if the if the pump is spinning you're likely moving some kind of water not guaranteed like the, there's there's all kinds of nitty gritties of each of these things I'm saying but if the pump is running then take a closer look at the tower see what's going on see why the tower can't get the water down uh, so yes you get to that point now let's say this happened on a larger scale uh, we got called because the building was tripping and we needed to figure out how we were going to uh, get the get the system back on. Now the customer, not knowing any better, has been going around resetting alarms the entire day or all morning. So they've just everything's been tripping out, and they've just been repetitively uh, cycling the control system, and the system just turn on, trips out, turn on, trips out. So they're going to want to keep trying to do that. Uh, and they may not even recognize or realize that their tower has a problem to begin with. So if you've got to make a decision where, hey, you've got to talk to the customer, which part of your building is the most critical? Because they, they, have, they have that, end of the day. Some part, some tenant, some space, whether it be IT rooms, whether it be executive suites, there is a particular part of their building that above all has to stay online. So get the tower fixed because until you fix the tower anyway, then resetting it is only going to cause more problems. Constantly just resetting those tripping units is going to just put more stress on those compressors. And that is going to be one side effect you'll eventually have to deal with. Those compressors are going to be running too hot and you do that repetitively you'll end up causing compressors to crash. So you'll have to talk the customer through that of, okay, we need to stop resetting until this tower gets addressed. Nothing else is gonna matter, nothing. We're not gonna be able to get the water temperature down properly until we fix whatever is going on at the tower. Maybe it's just a spray pump. Maybe the spray pump uh, blew some fuses. And uh, I was actually, we were just talking, uh, me and one of the other guys, uh, just yesterday, actually, and he was working on a working on a tower call. They kept having issues with the spray pump tripping. He went through Meg to analyze the spray pump; it was perfectly fine, uh, and he ended up figuring out that it was a, the spray pump was on a contactor across the line. So the high in rush current is what that would mean. Well, they had fast acting fuses, and that's what they kept putting in to try to run the pump motor. Well, on a setup like that, you can't do that. You need to use a time-delayed fuse. That way, that inrush current right at startup doesn't pop that fuse every time or every so many times of it doing that. Uh, so, yeah, ever since he put those time-delayed fuses in, he's had that issue go away. It could be something as simple as that uh, because if that spray pump can't, can't move water over the bundle, the bundle's never going to cool down. That's something else you're going to be able to hear and listen for is, is the pump on? Do I hear water falling? Uh, anyway, you fix the pump or you fix the fan, whatever the issue was. Once the water starts coming down on temperature, then you can move to the critical points in the system. Get those online first and give that tower a chance to catch up because if you don't get the loop temperature under control, and we have to do similar things with the chill water side of things on chillers. If you don't get the loop under control, you're gonna put, you're gonna put a lot of stress and you could, even, you could even be fighting an uphill battle uh, where you're making very little progress at a time because you're, you're trying to take on the entire system and the entire load, and you're trying to move all of this at one time and pull it back down. And you ju you're just gonna spin your wheels. So instead of doing that, that's, where, that's why we're identifying with the customer. Who is it in your space that can't go without? Where are your IT rooms? What units are those hooked to? If they don't have redundancy, because sometimes they don't, Run those units, let the loop come down, let that space start to cool down, 
as the loop gets under control, as you get close to set point, let's, again, let's just use 80 as an example, then, uh, then you can start resetting and bringing other systems back online and letting that loop slowly load itself back up and letting that tower having a chance to have caught back up uh, and you'll you'll get a faster recovery that way because we we do think that the fastest method of recovery is just get everything going and it's just it, it's just just get it all going. But you actually put a tremendous amount of mechanical wear on the entire system. And if you've got systems that are already running on edge, so let's say you've got a cooling tower fan motor, it's already running on edge. Maybe the spray pump is what tripped out and say it was a fuse issue. You put new fuses in, but it's fairly apparent, or maybe it's not apparent, maybe you don't even know, but that cooling tower fan, whether it be fan bearings, whether it be the motor itself, has some issues and it's on the edge of even being operational itself. The best thing you could do to get that building back online the fastest it can if that tower doesn't normally run at 100%, is to gradually stage into that load as much as possible and let that tower control that load as you pull down. And in my experience, you actually get a more effective and a faster pull down on the system once you've already taken it a chunk at a time. We do the same thing with automation systems. It's it's. That's got a lot to do with energy uh, savings, but it also has a lot to do with mechanical wear on the entire system and the electrical systems. And it, it's more than just an efficiency thing as to why when we turn a system on in the morning and we slowly stage it up, you know, we'll say we've got a four story building with eight wings. So two wings per floor. First wing gets turned on at 4 a.m. Second wing at 4.15 third wing at 4.30, 4.45, 5 o'clock, 5.15, 5.30, you get the picture. This, what this really allows us to do is we process the load, we process the, build, the building down, we minimize mechanical wear on our cooling system because we're not, having, we're not just slapping the thing for hours on end because if we did that all at once, it would take several hours for whatever chiller system or whatever's hooked to it, uh, even if it is self-contains. So it self-contains on a cooling tower. Well, you're slapping that tower hard with all of those self-contains at one time, trying to bring the whole building in. And the tower may not even be able to handle that. I don't know. Whereas when you stagger it and you strategically choose what turns on let it come up, let it throw its heavy load in, then let it get that under control. Then we bring in the next thing. It's going to slam the tower, bring it under control, back and forth, back and forth. We minimize how much load, and that tower fan is right on the freaking edge. If it runs anything north of 55 hertz, it's going to trigger a overcurrent or a ground fault on that drive. So if you can keep it below 55 hertz, then you're okay, right? That doesn't actually mean you're okay. Obviously, there's still a problem there. But in your specific scenario at that point, you're in an emergency. And your main focus isn't uh, it's to, it's to keep the building functional or to get it back to a functional state as much as you can. Even if you do have a motor issue, you've got something bigger that you can't immediately address. What can you do? What are the parameters it can run at to allow it to try to come in and stage on? Maybe you've got a bearing problem. The faster and harder you push those bearings, the worse they're going to get, the faster, the more heat they're going to generate. Uh, and and that is a, that's a very, very common issue is fan bearings. Uh, we, there's... That's just one of those things. They're in a very wet, they're in a very humid environment. Uh, and while they're typically, you know, you put some fairly decent uh, bearings in there, I do recommend, or for everybody at APS, we're going to be using the mobile uh, SHC 460, uh, the wet duty. It should be a white grease on, 
on those those fan bearings alone. Now that doesn't go in the motor. The motor gets uh, a typical uh, motor grease, like the mobile EM, if you can find it. But that's a common failure point. Or the belts. The belts tend to be a common failure point. Uh, a lot of the towers, the, the sheaves in there are not aligned very well. And that does turn into its own tension. Now, and, and, and if, there's a lot of back and forth on even whether or not you go a banded belt or you go uh, individual belts. I don't think there's a one size fit all. I do like the, the most, the, the, the theory that I find myself agreeing with the most is using single belts on cooling towers, at least smaller ones. Maybe some of the bigger ones, we've got really high torque. That's where that banded might uh, benefit you. But on smaller ones, the single belts help give just, yeah, they, they, just, they help give. They're not as rigid and you keep better contact point to point in the sheave. And even if you have a set of sheaves that are uh, slightly worn, the singles are going to help you get past that. Now, an issue with singles, especially if you've, if you've got really long ones, which a lot of times in towers we do, or if you're not tensioned properly, either or, the belts will slap together and they'll rub and that'll wear them out really quickly. So that's one of the, that's one of the big reasons not to use a, uh, not to use singles, but with bandits, uh, they're very rigid and they don't have a lot of play and they don't have a lot of give. And you've also got to make sure you've got the right sheave. So a 5V sheave and a B are not the same thing. Bs are broader, 5Vs are more narrow. So if you've got a set of 5Vs and you're putting Bs in it or vice versa, uh, you might also find that you have trouble because, with a banded where you might get away with it with singles. You know, it's not perfect, but you can, you can make it work with a single. But with a banded belt, uh, you'll end up... Um, you'll end up riding the top of the banded groove where, where they're all tied together. Uh, and, and you'll, that, that could cause its own problems. It's just, anyway, unless there's a reason to, I do suggest we use strand, uh, singles on the belts for towers, unless there's a very specific reason or a customer has a personal preference. You know, other than that, we've had better results running singles where they've lasted longer. We've had less bearing issues. We've had less motor issues running singles on towers. And we've gotten away from using bandits. And a lot of times they'll come from the manufacturer uh, brand new with a bandit. Not always, but sometimes. And when that bandit wears out, unless there's a reason to go back with a bandit, convert that to singles. We've just, we've had far better results with that uh, in a long-term scale. Uh, so, uh, mine don't overcurrent at 55 hertz. Let's see. So just kind of reading up on some of the things here. What about gearboxes? Okay, yeah, let's talk about gearboxes. Um, gearboxes are, they're, they're fairly effective. Personally, I like them. I do prefer the simplicity of a belt, but belts don't scale very well, and that's where gearboxes become really useful. Uh, now, you also, by the time you're talking to gearbox, you're talking about a pretty good sized tower. Not always, I do put them on smaller stuff. But if you don't know, a gearbox, so you'll have your support beam in the tower, and you'll have your motor. On one end, you'll have a shaft most of the time, not always, sometimes there's the motors will be closer to, but you'll have a shaft coming across that'll tie into the back of the gearbox housing. Uh, then your gearbox will be mounted in the middle of the tower and you'll have this uh, output shaft going up to your fan and so your fan will be attached up here. 
one of the things that trips a lot of people with with uh, gearboxes. Now alignment is critical. Alignment is extremely critical with the gearbox system and the shaft. So you just really keep up with that. But also the oil level inside of the tower. Now. Everything gets specific at some point, but some rules of thumb that we've practiced. First of all, a lot of the times over here on the bottom of the gearbox, you'll have an output hose that'll come up and you'll have this little uh, dip tube thing sticking up where you can pull that out and see. We'll, you know, it's supposed to be a, a rudimentary oil level check without having to climb into the tower. I don't recommend using those, especially if you personally have not calibrated it. So there's, there's the issue with using those is they're not, they're not reliable, end of the day. Just not reliable. Drink water. Because they're basically just a oil dipstick with some all thread on top, and you can adjust where the little... Um, uh, the little cap or the, the washer that's basically on top of it sits in its level. And you have some adjustment nuts that you have to set. So those don't come already preset or anything. All that has to be done as part of the commissioning and as part of the maintenance in the field. So if, if nobody ever does that, that stick is never reading accurate to begin with. But how you even check it uh, properly is... On the side of the gearbox, there's going to be some form of an oil port. Uh, typically, uh, there'll be like a four-sided uh, or square-sided uh, plug or something sitting in there. You'll take that out, and you'll basically just dip your finger in. You should, by sticking your finger into that hole, be able to uh, feel down into it and feel some form of oil level, like standing oil in the gearbox housing. This is just a, a, a rudimentary field check. This is not a precision thing. As long as you have oil up to that point, then you have, you have enough oil to run the gearbox properly, we'll say, quote unquote. Uh, you know, take, take this. This is some rule of thumb, so just be careful with that. And that's really, that, that is the way I do recommend checking that. Don't use the dipstick to, to do that. Uh, and even if, so how you would calibrate it, if you verified you had proper oil level already manually, then you would have to take and adjust that depth setting on the dipstick to where the, uh, it, it wouldn't show overfilled or it would, it would just show in the proper range on the dipstick. Uh, and this is with, obviously with the fan and everything off, you would check this with it off. Uh, even with the dipstick, you, you can't check it with it on because the whole system is in turbulence and that all that oil is, is uh, pulled into the gear housing being utilized to, to keep the gears uh, in there from grinding. So anyway, with it off, that's how you would adjust it to set the right depth. But an issue with that is cooling towers deal with a tremendous amount of vibration. Uh, they're just they're, they're naturally inherently that way. So I, um, what I see happen is the little nuts that they have on there that will lock that depth setting in eventually just vibrate loose and over time can significantly move themselves one way or the other. Typically they'll extend themselves out, which will mean that uh, you'll, you're reading deeper than you actually are. So that could end up telling you that you have too much oil or if you're losing oil at that time, uh, you may get low on oil, but because the depth gauge keeps reading deeper than it should, uh, you may not ever notice. So there's, there's just, there's, there's flaws. There's flaws in it. It's there. It exists as a measurement device. I just don't like it. What's our time? Let's see. Uh, have you performed laser alignments, gearbox shimming, or vibration analysis on gearbox before? Yes, Ryan. Uh, that is a part of our general inspections that we do. Uh, if you have any specific questions on that, 
Um, I will can, I can say I'm not an expert on the matter, but I can definitely do it. And we do, so we do function or we do perform uh, laser alignments and, um, you know, a, a vibrate when you're, when we're doing system analysis, we should be checking the vibration of, on the gearbox assembly as well as the motor, which is one reason why we've invested in our Bluetooth uh, vibration probes the way we have is so that we can safely do this, whereas used to, there was other methods that were not so uh, attractive. Anyway, um, one of the things that not everybody realizes a tower has is a vibration safety switch. Many times it's gonna be mounted here on this beam or on some structural beam close to the motor. Maybe the motor is mounted vertically. It'll be somewhere relatively close to the motor. Uh, in some cases it may be closer to the fans or, or, or the fan bearing assembly, but typically the, the motor is what I see. And, and it'll also be mounted to the same uh, frame that the motor and the fan are also mounted to. So it's gonna be real close to one of those areas. And all it is is just this little metal box mounted to, um, uh, mounted to the side of the frame. With a, it, this should have some form of like a little red or black reset button. If you ever have seen a high, uh, high static switch in a, in a uh, supply side of an air handler, it'll look very similar to that except it should be watertight, water sealed. Anyway, that switch, they, they do go bad. They can prematurely fail. You may not actually have excessive vibration. It just doesn't trip. They also, you may have excessive vibration and it won't trip. That's also a common one. They'll get stuck internally and the, the trigger springs won't, won't trigger or the relay won't won't kick the contacts out. So what its job is to do is to protect this uh, fan from coming on. So here's the setup. Uh, and I actually got, got to got to go through this a number of years ago with a with a, a junior tech. So he went out to the tower call and couldn't could not get the fan to run. It was on a contactor. It was nothing fancy. He was getting told from the auto, from the control system, the fan needed to run. Everything looked like it was there, but he could not get the fan to turn on. He could manually hit it. It would spin, but he could not get it to do it automatically. What it boiled down to, these sw switches are uh, ran in series with the fan control circuit, whether that be a uh, contactor uh, coil or a VFD start stop. So if this fan is on a VFD drive, most of the time the start stop on that drive is gonna run through uh, the, 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 the vibration safety. It could run through the emergency contact, so you could see it either way, but typically I, I see it run through the, the start stop. So what that's gonna do is, yeah, if that trips for any reason, doesn't matter why, it's kicking out. Now our, rule, our, our gut instinct, when that vibration switch trips, we shouldn't just assume it was some nuisance thing. We should investigate and see what's going on. And a way of testing those, if we're ever on a maintenance inspection, for example, we wanna see, is that working? Don't hit the literal switch. Uh, that's not, just don't, you, you'll, you'll break it. But you can take a mallet, you can take a hammer, you can take something of that sort and you ought to be able to hit the beam or the structural piece very close to the switch and see that switch trigger. And that should be, you know, if you get a real solid funk onto that beam and you, you should get some pretty solid vibration off of that, if you hit it right, uh, that switch should trip. If it doesn't and you're still able to run the fan without resetting it manually, you likely have a bad switch. So those are some things to look out for. But if you're on a service call and you're having that issue and you can't get the fan to go, go check your vibration switch. Uh, you may need a ladder to even get up there to it because it's up in the air so high. But check your vibration switch. Don't forget about that. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, da, 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 da. I service a tower that has shredded two tire type couplings this year already and was wondering uh, what you would look at first. Um, alignment. Alignment is, is always kind of be my go-to for something like that. Um, alignment will tell you a lot. It could be vibration. Typically, now, if, if, it is a, if it is vibration, which would indicate uh, alignment can cause a vibration issue, first of all. But let's say, let's say the alignment is good. Then by the time your bearings are able to vibrate to the point to be that excessive, you're likely going to hear them audibly. They're going to be pretty, they're going to be pretty noisy. Uh, if it's going to be bad enough to cause the, the couplings on the shaft to, to shred like that. So yes, alignment would be my ultimate first go-to. Make sure everything's square, it's lined up. My uh, X, Y, and Z axes are all in alignment with each other. If everything's good, um, then I've also seen where... Uh, uh, it's not very not very common, but I've seen where the uh, the tower conditions, whether that be chemical treatment or your water, something on the on the uh, air level, can attack those couplings and uh, attack the bearings, especially if you've got fairly rough chemical treatment, for example, um, or say maybe recently they've shocked the system and they didn't fully flush it properly. Just there are several things that, that could contribute to that that have nothing to do with the alignment, the motor, the gearbox, or anything. Uh, it's just environmental. So that's something to be aware of. It's not that common of an issue. Uh, See, I have vibration switches that get pretty degraded. Any tips on what might prolong that? Uh, or prevent that. Um, not much. Uh, ultimately, it's kind of the same thing. It's environmental. Is is your chemical treatment on par? Uh, is is it? Are you getting too much chemical? Is it too harsh? Uh, I'm not an expert on any of those things. So I'm not going to try to pretend to be. But um, that would be one of my main questions. Uh, now, in terms of those getting corroded and fouled and going bad. I mean, in my opinion, a, a quality switch ought to get you years, you know, five, 10 plus years of runtime without issue, if not even longer than that. Um, so if you're having to do it consistently before that, uh, maybe evaluate where you, with the, the switch itself or where they're, the, where they're sourced from. Maybe that's just the brand of switch is just not, up to par. It could be one you're ordering from the manufacturer directly. I, I don't know. Um, but I would also want to make sure that the gaskets and seals are getting put on uh, well. You know, if it's, it's, say it's failing internally, but it's not showing that much external uh, corrosion or anything, then it, you know, maybe, maybe it's just the, the water sealing isn't quite as tight as it needs to be and it's allowing it to get in there somehow. Uh, that would, yeah, that would be some things I would look for. If you have any questions, we are kind of coming up towards the end of this. Uh, I hope I've talked about this enough. Uh, let's see some other good conditions to talk about. So we've talked about airflow. We've talked about, you know, how to get the building under control if we lose the building due to a tower failure. So let's also talk about some, some water level controls. Um, if you're having high or low water, make sure that our uh, water levels are, or our level controller, whether that be the uh, a brass valve with a float, or whether that be an electronic valve with a sensing rod, something of that nature, uh, really critical that those function properly. Now, something else that'll happen, if you have really dirty towers, uh, scale on your bundles or uh, will they block heat exchange so keep a keep a real close eye on that make sure that that scale doesn't get too heavy that's going to play heavy into your chemical treatment as well now that's also why we need to do routine 
uh, cleanings a minimum once a year on your cooling towers to get in there with a pressure washer, knock that scale off. But that's also where uh, it's critical to have good treatment. Even, if, even on a closed loop system, that basin water needs to be treated to help minimize the scale buildup on your bundle itself. Because bundles are really difficult to clean, uh, at least in my experience. And uh, it's, it's that chemical treatment really is going to be what makes or breaks that. Some other issues we see, the strainers inside the tower. So each tower should have a strainer section. Uh, and this is going to be true whether it be for uh, open loop or closed loop, where the scale will just cling to that. And especially if you get a lot of scale or a lot of mud buildup, you know, some of these towers, especially if it's right off of a major highway, uh, they'll get a lot of mud in them. They'll literally fill up with a foot of mud uh, over a year's time because there's so much uh, major road traffic in that area that it just keeps all the dust stirred up. So, or even construction. We see that in downtown Austin all the time. Yeah, we've got a tower that for years has ran no problems, hadn't had a major issue. It's usually a fairly minimal cleaning. And then we go back out there um, and we all of a sudden we start seeing that it just it's it's literally we got to shovel it we, have to, we get so full of, of debris that we have to shovel it out with each inspection in a situation like that uh it's always been a, a building uh next door has started to get construction or renovation or something major has happened or they're doing some major uh street work down in the street and just all that extra dust that tower is going to just suck it right in uh, they're really good at that. They're, they're wonderful air filters, like wonderful air filters. Um, I got to say, we, we, I wish we could create a, a, um, uh, an air filter that uh, worked as good as that. that that'd be great. Um, uh, environment to worry about Legionnaires. Bri Ryan, yes. Legionnaires is a major concern with all towers. Now, I've got quite a bit of stuff that I've done. And I have an extremely laxed uh, tower policy. Uh, you know, I've not had any negative experiences with that. Um, but it is something that we have to take into account, and it is a risk. So with, with cooling towers, if you're doing tower work and you start to feel ill in any way, especially while working in the tower, uh, you need to seek assistance quickly because it is very possible it's very likely because of the temperatures and the conditions that exist within towers that um, uh, there could be something airborne in uh, from that environment coming out of that water whether it be bacterial or otherwise uh, yeah it, that is that is a risk of the industry we are in is the cooling tower space of it specifically uh, tends to just have a lot of growth and bacteria, just a lot of things that aren't really healthy for us. It is an absolute major concern. Um, I do agree with Watson there on having your, your towers tested. Um, uh, if you've got really good chemical treatment, most of the time, or in, in the towers are routinely maintained, most of the time you probably aren't going to have an issue. Most of the time. We really see those conditions, at least from what I understand, we see those conditions start to form when you have very uh, poorly maintained towers that have little to no chemical treatment in them. They're not being routinely cleaned. They're not being routinely serviced in any way. Uh, a tower left in that condition will develop a lot of bad stuff in it. And when you walk up and you see a tower that has extreme growth and extreme buildup in the bottom, and it just looks extreme, and you start talking to the property and they haven't, they either don't know or they haven't had anybody touch it, or maybe the chemical people that they've got that they're using, maybe there's somebody you don't necessarily trust. Um, you should proceed with caution and at minimum use uh, respirators. Um, 
if you're concerned about a condition like that. From what I understand, and I mean a, a full-on respirator, um, from what I understand, a respirator uh, is effective at eliminating the airborne particles we may end up running into. Um, somebody can pitch in on that if, if I'm wrong on that. But if I'm not mistaken, like the Home Depot respirators with the two filters on the side, that I believe is sufficient for uh, like Legionnaire's particles and things of that nature to where you could at least get in the tower if you had to do something. But in, in actuality, if a tower is truly in that condition, before it is serviced, it should get a full cleaning. It should get a full um, uh, chemical um, uh, shock is what they call it. You know, somebody uh, come in and shock the tower, go through that whole process. All right, we do need to come to a conclusion here. Uh, so high, low water, uh, you're, and so the high and low water is going to play a factor on your temperature control. The fan plays a factor. The dirtiness of the tower plays a factor. As I've stated, keep up with your strainers. Make sure that those are staying clean. Uh, they're not getting plugged up in any way. Um, economizers. So I'll touch on this quickly. So economizers are a heat exchanger. We'll worry less about the economizer side. Heat exchangers. A lot of tower systems may have a heat exchanger that uh, essentially open loop towers are cheaper than closed loop. So uh, a lot of times that'll happen. A building will, or maybe they've got a special environment where this matters, but a building will put an open loop tower outside but they'll put a heat exchanger or a, braze, or a plated exchanger. Uh, not, they're not typically braze plate, but they'll put a plated exchanger inside and then they'll have a closed loop condenser water system for their equipment and its own dedicated set of pumps. And you'll have another set of pumps for the cooling tower and the open loop. And so the two loops merge at the heat exchanger and they pass the heat through to one another uh, so the building water would be passing the heat over to the tower water side of the exchanger. That's going to process back up. Um, on, those, uh, on those heat exchangers, uh, they're typically fairly robust. Uh, you need to, the things to look out for is if they're having trouble maintaining temperature drop uh, and are they, which, which you would see on the on the building water side, you know, if you can't get a pro, apologize for that. I uh, thought thought I had fixed my camera where it wasn't going to do that. But at last, here we are. Okay, uh, I'll wrap this up quickly. Uh, yes, yeah, so heat exchanger. Uh, things to keep in mind on that front is um, uh, make sure you are uh, make sure when you go to do that, that's a uh, to break those down and clean them, put them back together. It's a big job. Uh, you have to be very specific. You have to be really document which panels went where. You know, in what order. And uh, make sure you get proper gaskets. I guess it's not something you're going to have a fast turnaround on. It's also not something we, we typically have to routinely do very much. Um, uh, you can and will build up inside of those eventually, and that will create its own issue. But, uh, um, yeah, that's what they're there for. They're there as a exchange to isolate um, the cooling tower outside water from whatever water is going through the inside system in the loop without having to have a full on closed loop system outside and the expense of those towers and such. You can go with a cheaper tower, but you're also having to buy a second set of pumps. Like there's, it's, it's not, I don't know how the money actually works one way or the other, but just for whatever reason, customer may choose one over the other. With that, we'll close it.